now it's time to go through an example showing you how this could work, just underlying the different estimators of the variance. I will say that the first thing, the lowercase n in previous slide, is 3 for the transient. I will make 300 steps. I will use a time variable that is 1 through n. And I have some parameters, theta, that's just 1 and 0 0.2. Doesn't matter too much. I will use a true standard deviation of 1.5. Then I will just use the general linear model. And then I will generate some random normal distribution numbers. I will do one for each time point with the x times theta mean value and the same standard deviation everywhere. And then let's just look at that. It looks like this. So it's just a straight line. So we're going to use a local linear model. And the truth is also a linear model, so everything should behave ideal. Of course, I have some noise, but that's how we are. Then I'll use a lambda for now of 0 0.9. Since you can say the local linear estimator is part of one of your assignments, then I won't share the exact code I use for that. But I do have it. And now I just define some functions that I can use. But that doesn't matter for what I want to illustrate. So if we were to just get an estimator of sigma after running the code using ignoring the first three observations and look at uh, all the one step prediction errors then we get an estimate of 1.67 so that is a global estimate after all the fact of what we did here with the predictions that we had here not too bad. I mean, the true value was 1.5. But let's look at the local first. Let us look at how is the memory. So for the first few observations, we don't have that. This is plotting t. Then, But after, say, 50, we are already pretty much at 10. So this is, again, saying when n becomes large, the memory is stationary. So 0 0.9 lambda equals 0 0.9 means that t is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus lambda, which is then equal to 1 divided by 0 0.1, which is 10, as we also see here. Good. Now, what I'll do is to illustrate what if I use t minus p as denominator versus n minus p as denominator when I estimate sigma. Let me just finish the plot here. So the true value is 1.5, the green line here. Then if I nominate by t minus p as I proposed, then we get something that is hovering around, maybe slightly above in this case, the true value. However, when we divide by n minus p, we see that it slowly converges towards zero. So it's not going to return anything that is close or relative close to the true value, particularly not when n is increasing. Now, if we look at the one-step prediction errors, y minus y pred, some of those squares, just put the first tree to zero to ignore the influence from those. If I then do the cumulative sum of those, and again put the first to NA to ignore those again, then I can add a line where I show what is that actually given. So if I make that estimator, let me just update the legend. If you do a running mean value of that, we see that it also behaves fairly nice. It does converge, but to a value that is slightly higher than the true value. Somewhere that is the estimate that we just got previously, 1.67, whatever it was. Now, if we 
do almost the same as before, but we just normalize all the one-step prediction errors that we have up here. We normalize those by the scale, the prediction scale that we just discussed, and do the same way of getting around the first initial point. Then we get an estimator for the magenta line. Again, let me add the legend updated. So we have a norm running mean value. We see that even after around 30 observations, it's very, very close to the true value, and it remains very close to the true value. So that is, you can say, the motivation for using this normed running mean value. And let's just look at this scale that we use to normalize with. In the beginning, we did not have more, we only had four observations, so it's very, very large. But then it slowly converges to around 1.211, as it says down there. So actually, the inflation that we saw in the previous plot here, in the end, is 21% too high the contribution at every point in time when we're out there. So that's the reason why we should do this. Now, this example here, I only simulated one set of data. Now, what if I simulate many? So I wrapped all of the above in some code, and then I'm just going to do 200 simulations of that. Doesn't take too long time. And then we'll have a look at how does this actually behave. If we use the normed, sorry, then we get a medium of 0.98. And here I normalized the values by the true value. So we should expect a 1. The maximum is very close to 1, but not quite 1. If you do the same thing for the unnormed, then the median is one, almost 1.1. Uh, 1 .1. So, and the mean is also much greater than, and even the minimum is much further away and the maximum is 1.8, whereas up, also up here, the minimum up here is also quite far away. But I simulated 200, so I have to look at the distribution. It will have tails. But let's try to plot this. So let me just add one layer at a time. What I'm plotting are quantiles. So I'm plotting the minimum, a uh, quartile, sorry, the, the minimum, the 25, the 50, the 75, and the 100%. Uh, quantile, uh, percentile for each of the data relative to the true value that, that we have here as a 1. And then I do that for another prediction. So here I can see how it behaves over time. And let me just add the th last one. So the black one that is in here, that's the norms that we like. The red one is the unknown, and what we can see is, I know it's a bit busy this plot, we can see that they are almost always above, but there are some times where they end up being below. And if we just do the one-step prediction errors and divide by n at the time, then we get something that is consistently too low, as also expected. So this is the in time, so it's the estimate at time t that we normalize with there. So we look at the what is the error between the observation and the updated estimate at that point in time. We have n of those, so it's fair enough to do that estimator, but it's consistently too low because it includes information of the most recent observation. So we should do the normed prediction error. Now, another way to represent this whole thing is to look at the proportion of estimates that are below the true sigma. If you do it again, now the order of plotting is different. So here is the unnormed that we have down here. We see that it's consistently very low. Here is the proposed norm method, 
and here is the one where we use the in time. So what we would want is to have it hovering around 50% are above and 50% below. So, but what we do see is that the proposed norm prediction method gives something where 60% are at least below, that means 40% above, so it's fairly central, not ideal, but that's as good as it gets right now. So that was that presentation there. Now to get back to the question that we had before, well, a high lambda means a high memory. So high memory is the top one, because that's the one that is closest to the global estimator. 